Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to season two of the Nakabi Diaries podcast, a platform dedicated to sharing the stories of the women behind the veil. This season, we will be speaking to more Muslim women from all walks of life as we continue to discuss their deep and intimate reasons for wearing the niqab. The Nakabi Diaries, our experiences, our perspectives, our voices. I'm your host, Samar, and thank you for listening. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, sister. How are you? Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Very good. Thank you. Um, Jazakallah khair for joining us today on the Naqabi Dari. Sister, could you please introduce yourself for us and tell us a little bit about what you do? Sure thing. Um, so my name is Tuscany Bernier. Um, I currently live in Indiana. I'm mainly a writer, um, but I feel like I, I do a lot of different creative things. Um, so maybe it's more appropriate. I just call myself a creative. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I actually converted back in uh, 2012 and I've been Muslim for a few years now. So Alhamdulillah. 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 So could you share with us a little bit about your um your how how your journey to Islam and how you came to accept Islam? Sure, sure, absolutely. Um so I actually grew up in a really, really, really small town. Um I like to describe it as a town that didn't even have like a stoplight. Um Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very, very small. Um my family actually grew hay for other people's cows and um it was just very 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 rural and honestly there was absolutely no diversity so um i happened to get twitter which was amazing because we didn't have high speed internet for most of my teenage years um and i'm not that old it's just it was really far out there <laughs> and um yeah so there was a girl who kind of briefly mentioned that she was muslim and i realized I didn't know much about Islam. So you did it on Twitter, yeah? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. And um I think she was like literally like it was a picture of her next to the Kaaba and I realized like, oh, this is like very new and different. I don't mm-hmm. know much about it. So um I Googled like what do Muslims believe? You know, and it came up with the Quran. And so I Googled like where do I get one of those? <laughs> and um yeah, so went to a bookstore, got a Quran, um, and I started reading Surah An-Nisa um, because I kind of came from a very ignorant background. I think I presumed that the chapter called The Women would probably show um, why God hated women or something. You know, oh, I had wow. <laughs> an idea about Islam. And then, of course, I'm reading it, and Surah An-Nisa is nothing like that. It's... Uh, um, you know, a lot of a lot of rules, but the rules about the edges of society. Mm. And as I was reading it, I felt like, okay, if God is real, then it would make sense that He would make these rules for all people everywhere, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it it proved to me that God was real, I guess, and. Um, So it really didn't take much longer after that. I think maybe I started reading from the beginning, from like Surah um, Fatiha and then Surah Al-Baqarah. And I realized like, when they talk about they, meaning I guess like, you know, the Qur'ans of the world, meaning Allah, um, it would mean me. I'm a believer. Like, you know, um, it was not a very deep story i suppose as far as like my understanding at that point but i just felt like whoever created this quran like you know whoever wrote it 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 had to be about me and of course like now i have a a deeper understanding of like the quran and, and islam and um it's been a wonderful journey really Alhamdulillah, mashallah. So you, you kind of pretty much came to Islam by yourself? Yeah, basically. Just out of pure curiosity, subhanAllah. Alhamdulillah. Wow, that's amazing. So how did you come to take the shahada then? How did that work? 
Um, well, I, I consulted with Professor Google. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you know, I, I did ask Google, like, so how do people become Muslim, you know, and, and it was saying, you know, you can kind of do it at home. But I, I think um, from growing up Christian, I had this very institutionalized idea about coming to a new religion. So I Googled where the nearest mosque was, and um, I actually came to the town where I'm living now. And I showed up and I said, hey, I want to become Muslim. Mashallah, mashallah. And what was the kind of response? Because <laughs> that must have been a surprise. You know, um, like for my family or for the local mosque? Well, both. <laughs> so <laughs> I laugh because I, I still find this so embarrassing so many years later. Every time I see this uncle, I think about this story and I just hope he's forgotten it. But um, there was a particular uncle. Um, who's still very involved in the community. He's um, much, much older. And he gave me full salams, you know, he, he just, instead of saying hello, and so I asked him if he spoke English, which is awful, but I didn't know because yeah. he, you know, hadn't yet. Um, and so then I told him, like, I want to convert to Islam. And then he understood, you know, but for a brief moment, he looked at me like, really? Wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> Mashallah. And so yeah, then then I um I decided, you know, to become Muslim and, and they, they called some people to help witness my shahada and um and then I went home. Mashallah. So did you find that you had assistance from those Muslims afterwards or was you still kind of relying on Sheikh Google to learn about the deen? <laughs> um, you know, it was it was kind of a mixture of both. Um I would say there wasn't a lot of help in my community. Mm -hmm. um, there was one sister in particular who really tried her best, but she was, she was very pregnant, you know, and then she was a new mom. And, and I think it was a bit hard for her to keep up like long term with me, which is totally fine. Mm -hmm. um, but she helped me like with the, um, like how, how to say things in, in Salah and how to like, you know, really solidify it. I think yeah. I stayed with her. For a whole weekend actually and and it really jump started my islamic journey you could say mashallah alhamdulillah so what about getting to wear the hijab how was that process for you how did that work well i had um what little i knew about muslims was um that that modesty was very important and before i um converted to islam i had done some religion hopping let's say and so the the last thing that i had tried was um being very apostolic pentecostal which is known for their very modest clothing um so i already had like long skirts long sleeves this sort of thing i just wasn't wearing a headscarf so um it actually provided a, a rather natural transition into wearing the hijab mm -hmm. and um I was still really scared though. Right. I think um, back then I I just really feared what people would say. Mm -hmm. I didn't know any Muslims and I knew nobody else I knew knew any Muslims. Yeah. You know, so I, I was aware on some level how this would look to other people, like, oh, she joined this religion where none of us understand it does she even understand it you know um yeah, yeah. i can definitely um, relate to that it's just and then you put the hijab on and then like in my experience you know when i became muslim and stuff like you put the hijab on and then you're looking different and then people will like randomly just start asking you questions that you don't know the answers to and then you kind of feel stupid because they expect you to know these answers but it's just like well I understand enough to be a Muslim, but it doesn't mean that I know everything about Islam as well. So, yeah, that's quite a difficult um, transition. Exactly. Period. Yeah, especially just being put on the spot. I think even if it, even um, if it was a, if it was a case where you still know a lot about Islam, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily easy for you to like just respond to things when you've been put on the spot because often people like just pull at, pull pull things out of the air and just ask you questions out of the blue. And you know you kind of caught off guard. So unless you're practiced with um, responding to certain things, it can be really, really difficult. 
So it's just a, what about your what about your family then? How how did they kind of take you becoming a Muslim and when you did start to try wearing the hijab, how did that how did that work? That's a great question. I so um <laughs> my parents are actually divorced. Mm -hmm. um, and my mom lives out of state and I grew up with my dad and my grandma. Um, I call her Nana. So um, when I came home and I was telling my dad and Nana about, you know, I, I became Muslim and, and, you know, I came home with this Quran in my hand and, and I was kind of um, interested in it. They were relatively accepting, I would say. Um, at that point, um, my dad was really struggling with alcoholism, actually, I think. Um, and so I remember him just not really being in the right mindset that day. Hmm. Um, but he was still fairly supportive. He was like, you know, Tuscany, I don't believe God's real, so it doesn't matter. You can do whatever you want, which I guess is like not the end of the world as far as responses go. Um, my mom was a lot more harsh, actually. Um, oh, and I should I should add my my nana was um, she was quiet, but she was receptive. Mm. Um, so yeah, it it wasn't too bad. It was around that time actually that I I moved out of my dad's house and and got a place of my own. Um, but my mom really didn't take it well. Okay, so um, what about you? How what, what was your transition into the niqab? What made you want to wear the niqab itself? Yeah, it was it was about a year into me being Muslim. Um, it was something just that I had seen um, very very rarely. You know, I live in an area where the niqab is not normal. Um, it's not commonly worn by the Muslims in the area. Um, one of the sisters that I knew wore it, um, and I, I really looked up to her in some level. Um, but then I had also heard, you know, that there were people in Islamic history that had worn it. So, you know, it wasn't just a cultural garment. It was um, something, something very real. I think it was something that I kind of just wanted to experiment with not necessarily in this um, frivolous, like, oh, you know, I'm going to dress up kind of way. Um, but the way it had, it had been explained to me was that Islam had different levels of hijab. Mm -hmm. And that um, the different levels were for somebody to figure out themselves. So it was, it was more of a curious exploration. Um, and when I started wearing it, I started noticing more peace within myself, um, more tranquility, more God consciousness, um, because it's like literally there on your face, right? So, yeah. um, you know, it, it, it really helped my faith in a positive way. Come to you now. So how long have you been wearing it for now, sister? Oh, that's a good question. I think it's been about seven years. Okay, alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. So would you say that you found it easy to start wearing the niqab? And if, if, if so, why or why not? Mm, that's a good question. I would say the niqab was in between. Um, so... I had gotten a few different colors um, from eBay, you know, and of course I just had them sent to my house and, um, you know, at this point I was living by myself, so um, there wasn't as much pullback as maybe some other people might have if they're still living with um, non-Muslim relatives or um, anything like that, but I had... Um, I think I still struggled a lot. Okay. In which sense? I think I struggled with it mentally in a way, you know, because um, it's, it's not the norm even amongst the Muslim community. Um, you know, I noticed very quickly that there were 
more Muslims willing to tell me how I should and shouldn't dress rather than like supporting me on my Islamic journey. Yeah. You know, no one asked me like, how's your praying going? You know, like, how, how are you really doing? How's your family? People were just like, well, in my country, we don't wear it like this, so you shouldn't either. Oh, and, um, you know, it was, it was just kind of difficult. Um, in, in some capacity, it, it made me a bit more stubborn um, because I just thought like, well, I'm going to kind of do what I want. Um, and I, I would say in the early stages, I also had this awareness of of how freeing it is to be this person without, not without a body, but like, you know, it's, it's such an image-based society. Mm. So it, it kind of neutralized a lot of that for me. And it was more like my personality was bigger than anything else. And that was so, so, so freeing. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. So did you have any um, obstacles from anybody in your family for, wear, for, for wearing it? Um, <laughs> you know, honestly, I would say my family, for the most part, once I started wearing the hijab, they were like, well, whatever, she's already being weird. So when, she, <laughs> when I started wow. wearing the niqab, they were like, well, that's just more of her being kind of weird. Um, <laughs> I got less pushback for it, I would say, um, than from the Muslim community. Um, but I also think part of that is just, like, I always try to make sure that, like, my niqabs are, like, colorful. I like to wear a lot of colors because that's very normal where I live. Um, you know, so for them, they thought, okay, she's wearing things that clearly make her happy. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I, I feel like there was less pushback. Alhamdulillah. So you are that in the community, the non-Muslim community where you live. Have you faced any kind of abuse or at, at all for wearing the niqab? And how have people taken you in the community, the change? Well, I would say it, it, it was very difficult. I have a habit of going to the same places now over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like if I go to certain coffee shops or certain parks. And part of that is just to create a familiarity. Um, I have had a fair amount of people really not understand my Islam or my outward appearance as a Muslim. So like even when I was just wearing hijab, I remember um, it was it was a very hot July back in like 2012, 2013, something like this. I mentioned to my Nana, you know, I was like, I'm hot because yeah. <laughs> um, it was outside. And, um, and this woman pulled me aside from my grandmother. We were walking. So my Nana actually didn't notice for a bit. And she started yelling at me and telling me to go back home and that wow. um, if I was going to live in America, then I needed to, you know, wear things more appropriate for the weather and I mean, just being really awful. And it really bothered my, my Nana for a long time, I think. Um, because I think on some level, you fear your children being taken from you when they're little, but you don't expect someone to snatch your grandchild away from you as an adult. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it it really worried her and startled her for a while um i've been let go of jobs from jobs um for for being visibly muslim um many many times it kind of helped launch me into my writing career because um i really was looking for jobs where i could kind of make it on my own terms like you know i wanted to be able to ultimately wear the niqab like full time and not have to worry about people being mean as much mm -hmm. so w on, on that note would you describe the niqab as being a barrier and if so which um, sense hmm. 
That is a really good question. I would say it is and it isn't, um, but it's it's like it's not really the niqab that's the barrier, right? It's it's the mindset of the people where they're so like they're so bent on making sure that you think that you're oppressed that they don't realize that they're the ones doing the oppression yeah and um you know sometimes i just have to tell people like literally it would be fine if you just stopped <laughs> you know like it, it doesn't have to be all this and it's hard for some people to wrap their heads around. um you know and there's such a pressure to be acceptable looking which is is such a farce in the first place yeah, of course. Um, yeah so when you make a decision that's very purposeful like i absolutely do not want to participate in this overly image-based um frankly anti-woman world people will take offense to that mm -hmm. no definitely i agree with you though i do agree with you because literally everything is based upon outward appearance you know and it's like you're judging your outward appearance and then you have to kind of prove that your inward is as good as maybe you how your outward perception is it's like kind of like that absolutely so sister Masha, like you, you said that you you know um because of jobs that you've been having problems with getting work and things like that um you decided to launch your writing career so what kind of jobs were you doing previously and how how did you transition from that and where did you kind of get the idea to go into having a writing career yeah i i've actually done so many um so many like little jobs here and there i would say like I did Uber driving for a while. Oh, wow. I worked in telecommunications. I've worked in fast food. I've worked um, in like a, um, how would I phrase it? I guess like a, a janitorial setting. For a while, I owned my own cleaning business. Mashallah. Um, yeah, and so part of it was just I also like the cleaning business probably would have been fine, but I also desperately needed to relax more. It's, it's a very, um, very hard job, you know, very hard on the body. You're working with a lot of chemicals all the time. And mm. I was like, you know, what, what do I really enjoy? And, and one of my oldest hobbies and enjoyments um, has been writing the, the crafting of words. Mashallah. So what kind of things do you write about? I like to write, um, I like to expand my horizons about the different things that I write. So I feel like typically these days, um, I'm not creating a whole lot because of COVID. I feel like it's kind of um, put a wrench in my my creativity, but I'm hoping to kind of um, break through that pretty soon. Mashallah. Um, so like my my current thing is just like answering questions occasionally for about islam.net mm -hmm. um and i i really enjoy that i love to answer people's questions about islam. um but yeah like previously i've written things on like life and love and islam and in tech and in news current modern day events history um sometimes i like to write poetry like i really just kind of go everywhere um i enjoy that alhamdulillah so do you have like a website or a blog or something like that yes i do um you can go to tuscanybernier.com and it will have everything in relation to me. Um, there's like my previous articles, um, there's my blog. I even have like some bad poetry that I've written, um, bad just because I, I feel like I'm not a very good poet. <laughs> but I, I do enjoy to, um, to share my creations with the world um, just because I feel like that's, that's the essence of, of humanity. We all want connection. 
MashaAllah. So um, you've worn the hijab and you've worn the niqab. Do you feel that there's a difference in how you've been treated personally and in your community? Could you Can you see any difference or do you think there's a difference between the way um, the sisters who wear the hijab, the scarf, get treated um, comparing to the sisters who might be wearing the niqab, for example? Mm, mm, yes, yes. I would say... Um... So, outside the Muslim community, I feel like both are still um, kind of difficult for people to wear. There's a growing acceptance of hijabis, I think, like in mainstream stuff, um, just slightly, ever so slightly, <laughs> to the point where I think people are realizing it's not something foreign. You know, you can, of course, live here and wear hijab. Um, and... I'm not seeing quite the same level of acceptance for niqab yet, but that's just because A, there's less of us, and B, I feel like um, there's less women kind of going out and, and advocating that it is equally okay. Yeah. Um, I think that there's still an issue we have internally and externally from the community where we're like, yeah, you know, accept my version of hijab, but don't accept this other person. That's too far. That's yeah, too basically. Far. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, so sometimes niqabis are still thrown under the bus. <laughs> um, but I would say um, internally in the community, I've definitely seen um, a difference between wearing the hijab and the niqab. And a lot of that comes from people's assumptions, you know, um, there seems to be this idea that niqabis think a lot of themselves <laughs> and yeah. really we're just regular people yeah subhanallah like i was talking with the sister before and we were saying the same thing and I, I was saying i don't i personally don't know where this kind of um perception comes from you know about niqabis like that we're really strict or you know we don't want to talk to people and we don't know how to have a laugh and things like that you know this kind of kind of idea that exists even in the muslim community i mean i can understand to an extent with maybe non-muslims because we're covering our faces so it's hard for them to maybe read like you know have an idea of what we might like do you know what i mean like they might be, may feel that they can't approach us for example and things like that but in the muslim community you know often muslims they you know they they think the kind of negative way that, um, about um peep sisters who wear the niqab and i've experienced this like even when i wasn't wearing the niqab like sisters would say things like that and i was always confused why they would think that because i personally didn't have that kind of um belief so i don't know where this comes from in the muslim community really it's quite strange well, I think that there is like a very, 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 very small minority of Niqabi women who um, maybe intend well, but are not very good at like Nusiha that really changes the heart, you know. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they um, intend to, to, to just help somebody, right? But maybe their words are harsh or these types of things and... Um, and I think it's happened enough where people think it's the norm, um, but the reality is is that it's it's not. And and the thing is, I would say when it comes to um, the the minorities that are are bad at at Nasiha really, because like every every type of group, every um, you know any niche maybe um, in the Muslim community will have have groups of people who who really want to try to to change um, their community for the better but they just don't know how to do it yeah kindly yeah basically yeah subhanallah so um have you had any experience traveling while wearing the niqab at all um just within the united states mm -hmm. i haven't traveled internationally so what was that like? Um, I had once traveled from Indiana, where I live, um, over to LA, and I was actually expecting a lot of hardship at the airport. And then I thought, like, oh, California is going to be super chill. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I actually had no hardship at the airport, which was very weird. Um, I actually went with a hijabi friend, and she got stopped by the airport security, but I didn't. Okay. Um, I <laughs> but, yeah, it was just kind of like, oh, I wasn't expecting that. And then um, once I got to California, there's, um, <laughs> how would I put it? Mm, it's like so few people wear as much clothes. <laughs> um, so people really thought it was very bizarre. Um, when I visited LA, most of the women I was in contact with didn't wear hijab at all. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise they still dressed fairly modestly. And then I went out on the street and I realized like people literally wear like a, a crop top and like very, very short shorts, you know, et cetera. And, and so these sisters who weren't wearing the headscarf still looked very modest according to like California culture. So I looked like really bizarre, but yeah. um, it was, it was interesting. You know, the sisters there seemed very receptive because they were like, well, we just hadn't had the opportunity to meet very many hobbies either. Um, and I think I just wasn't expecting it to turn out like that. Mm. SubhanAllah. So would you, would you think that was kind of um, like a negative experience or almost or positive? Like, like how do you kind of gauge that experience? Oh, I mean, I would say um, overall it was, it was a positive experience. I really enjoyed going. It just was not what I was expecting. And I don't think I would change anything when I would go, you know, because I, I'm still going to dress the way I do, but now I have an awareness. Um, I would say that I think I was naive. I thought like, oh, this is supposed to be a very liberal place. They're going to be very understanding. Um, but the reality is that some, some types of liberal people are only interested in people looking a certain way still yeah and that's, so. well, that's i've always found that quite strange as well because i mean people consider themselves to be like open-minded but they're actually not that open-minded yeah yeah absolutely yeah subhanallah so have you met any sisters in your community or otherwise even online who um you know, maybe they've reached out to you and said that, well, they'd like to wear the niqab, for example, but they're not allowed to wear it. Or have you met any sisters who have been forced into wearing it? I have. I, I've met both. You know, I, um, I have traveled a fair amount around the U.S. Mm -hmm. And so I've, I've met with many women across many communities from all walks of life. And, um, you know, I think I was really startled the first time I realized um, there's actually a woman in my current community, she no longer lives here, um, but she she admitted, she was like, yeah, I'm, I'm being forced to wear it. And I, I was so startled, yeah, because, mm -hmm. because I, I thought she was um, very happy and um, that her marriage was happy and that, you know, um, I think I just had certain ideas of what that would look like. And, and she just was like, well, you know, we're just working through it. And um, over time, she was able to kind of talk to her husband about the importance of making sure that she's, of course, still modest, but still choosing what she's wearing, you know, not forcing yeah. her into it. Um, and yeah, I, I guess just that whole experience went so much more differently than I I had expected um, I think because she was so close to my life um, it, it wasn't like a faraway story um, I, I actually really look up to her for her perseverance during that time um, and 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 even up till now I, I, I just think she's a lovely human being um, but I've I've met a huge amount of sisters that have told me, I wish I could wear it, but I can't. Mm. And what are their reasons? 
Um, you know, it really depended on the the individual person. You know, some women were like, I really want to wear the niqab, but my husband is forcing me to not wear it. Um, or I feel like I would not be welcome at my job and we need the job to make sure we can stay here, you know. So then they wouldn't wear it or, um, you know, sometimes people did associate it with like a cultural thing. So like I met some sisters who said like, yeah, whenever I go visit like to Egypt or Jordan, I always wear the niqab, but when I come back here to Tennessee, then I don't wear it, mm. um, things like that. So, um, so do you think it's more like they they feel that they can't wear it because they're in the U.S. and it's not something that is accepted, but when they go back home, they feel more relaxed, so they think that yeah, like I can wear it. A hundred and ten percent. That's exactly it. So what would you, um, what do you advise sisters who are in like these kind of situations, like sisters, for example, who they really would like to wear the niqab, but they feel like um, not confident to wear it and things like that. What kind of advice would you give them? Well, I typically advise for any person who is um, seeking a good relationship with their creator, which hopefully, inshallah, is all of us, um, to really do some introspection about their why, you know, like why, why be modest, why pray, why, you know, and as you start ex um, exploring your why and, and internalizing how important it is to foster this good relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then it starts to come more naturally like even when people are being rude even when people are discouraging you when you think about the most important relationship in your life which should be Allah um then it becomes much easier because you do it out of love of course yeah subhanallah Oh, mashallah, that's so true, you know, I think um, this, is, this is something that I, as well, I try to encourage sisters the same way because the reality is when we look at the Sahaba and how they used to live, whenever the commands from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came down in the Quran, they was ready to accept them because they had spent such a long time nurturing that kind of love for Allah and, you know, they had this um, hope for Jannah and fear of the hellfire, so there was the, they had this knowledge with them that made the command so easy to follow afterwards you know it was and obviously they lived in a different time from us anyways the quran was being revealed like you know through their different situations but we have the quran now so anytime like we're going through anything in life whatever situation we're in we can take time to look at the quran to read it and to trust try to apply it into our lives you know that's what is it's hit like it's the book till the end of time so it's important that we nurture that relationship with the quran learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, learn about his beautiful names and attributes as well, you know, so that we can really get to know Allah, who he is, and, you know, really learn to love him, inshallah. So, and that makes everything easier, you know, when you can do things with more sincerity as well, inshallah. It's life-changing, I think. When you get to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is absolutely life-changing. Yeah, subhanAllah. So sister, um, just, just to end the interview now, I'll ask you the final question, which is, what does the niqab mean to you? Ooh, I like this question. Um, what does the niqab mean to me? For me, it's, it's, um, it's been my personal choice to consistently put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over the dunya. Um, because I think I'm the kind of person who, um, I mean, most women are this way. We, we enjoy looking pretty, you know, we enjoy, um, on some level, we do enjoy um, having a good image. And, and the niqab is like this very purposeful, like, wait, no, I'm going to put up a wall. I'm going to make sure that I am reassessing, like, am I doing this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Like, um, and it's like this regular, um, 
thing that kind of um, forces me to stop and think about this whenever I do anything outside the house. And, and I, I'm infinitely grateful for that. I think um, it doesn't necessarily have to be the niqab, you know, somebody else might have like a, a certain prayer rug that they carry with them that gives them like this similar feeling of, of um, stopping and questioning. But for me, the niqab has done that. And, um, and it's, it's been very freeing. I, I enjoy it a lot. Alhamdulillah. 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 sister, for giving us your time. And I'm sure the listeners will really enjoy and benefit, um, you know, from what you've said. Alhamdulillah. Thank you for having me. You've been really kind and I've really enjoyed this. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair, sister. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The Nikabi Diary Season 1 ebook with clickable links for each episode is available now, complete with 52 illustrations and inspirational quotes from each podcast guest. Click on the link in the description to get yours.